And welcome to Nerd Squad Radio Theater. Today's presentation, Sherlock Holmes. Yay. Both A Scandal in Bohemia and The Speckled Band. Two of my personal favorite stories. They're really good stories. Yes. So, we will uh, be waiting for our final actor to appear. Chance Rigdon will be in this, and he is attempting to get out of a meeting and on his way. He's on his way, so it won't be long. It won't be long. So as it is right now, you will be hearing some music, and then we will be starting. So. Ooh, Hawk Nelson. I like Hawk Nelson. Hawk Nelson might have to be paused once Chance gets here. But I know. But anyway. All right. Thank you. Welcome to Nerd Squad Radio Theater's presentation of A Scandal in Bohemia. Starring Matt Donnelly as Sherlock Holmes, myself, Alex McConnell, as John Watson, Meg Burnett as Irene Adler, and she's, and, uh, or, Chance Rigdon as Ormstein and a random voice, God, uh, Micah Mangimelli as Godfrey and a random beggar, Angel Lapointe as a random beggar, another random voice, and an old woman. This will be a two-part episode showcasing Scandal in Bohemia and the Speckled Bat. Now, the Scandal in Bohemia. To Sherlock Holmes, she's always the woman. I have seldom heard him mention her under any other name. In his eyes, she eclipses and predominates the whole of her sex. It was not that he felt any emotion akin to love for Irene Adler. All emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. But for the trained reasoner to admit such institutions into his own delicate and finely adjusted temperament was to introduce a distracting factor which might throw a doubt on all his mental results. And yet there was but one woman to him, and that woman was the late Irene Adler, of dubious and questionable memory. I had seen little of Holmes lately. My marriage had drifted us away from each other. My own complete happiness, and the home-centered interests which rise up around the man who first finds himself master of his own establishment, were sufficient to absorb all attention, while Holmes, who loathed every form of society with his own bohemian soul, remained in our lodgings in Baker Street buried among his old books, and alternating from week to week between cocaine and ambition, the drowsiness of the drug and the fierce energy of his own keen nature. He was still, as ever, deeply attracted by the study of crime, and occupied by his immense facilities and extraordinary powers of observation in following out those clues and cleaning up those mysteries which had been abandoned as hopeless by the official police. One night, I was returning home from a pit... To, from a journey to a patient, for I now returned to civil practice, when my way led me to, through Baker Street. As I passed the well-remembered door, which must always be associated in my mind with my wooing and with the dark incidents of the study in Scarlet, I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again, and know how he was employing his extraordinary powers. His rooms were brilliantly lit. Even as I looked up, I saw his tall, spa, spare figure pass twice in a dark silhouette against the blind. He was passing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk upon his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew his every mood and habit, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was at work again. Wedlock suits you, I think, Watson, that you have put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you. Seven? Indeed. I should have thought a little more. Just a trifle more, I fancy, Watson. And in practice again, I observe. You did not tell me that you intended to go into harness. Then how do you know? I see it. I deduce it. How do I know that you have been getting yourself very wet lately, and that you have a most clumsy and careless servant girl? My dear Holmes, this is too much. You would certainly have been buried had you, had you been lived a few centuries ago. It is true that I had a country walk on Thursday and came home in a dreadful mess. As I have changed my clothes, I can't imagine how you deduce it. As to Mary Jane, she is incorrigible, and my wife has given her notice. But there, again, I fail to see how you work it out. <laughs> it is simplicity itself. My eyes tell me that on the inside of your left shoe, just where the firelight strikes it, the leather is scored by six almost parallel cuts. Obviously, they have been caused by someone who has a very carelessly scraped around the edges of the sole in order to remove crusted mud from it. Hence, you see, my double deduction that you had been out in vile weather, and that you had a particularly malignant boot slitting specimen of the London slavery. As to your practice, if a gentleman walks into my room smelling of iodoform, with a black mark of nitrate of silver upon his right forefinger, and a bulge on the right side of his top hat to show where he has secreted his stethoscope, I must be dull, indeed, 
if I do not pronounce him to be an active <laughs> member of the medical profession. When I hear you give your reasons, the thing always appears to be to me so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself. Though at each successive instance of your reasoning, I am baffled until you explain your process. And yet I believe my eyes are just as good as yours. Quite so. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead up from the hall to this room. Frequently? How often? Well, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? How many? I don't know. Quite so. You have not observed, and yet you have seen. That is just my point. Now, I know that there are 17 steps, because I have both seen and observed. By the way, since you are interested in these little problems, and since you are good enough to chronicle one or two of my trifling experiences, you may be interested in this. It came by the last post. Read it aloud. There we will call upon you tonight, a quarter to eight o'clock, a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe has shown that you are one who may be safely trusted with matters which are of no importance, that, which can hardly be exaggerated. This account of you we have from all quarters received. Be in your chamber then at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. This is indeed a mystery. What do you imagine that it means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories. Instead of theories, suit facts. But the note itself, what do you deduce from it? The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. Such paper could not be bought under half a crown a packet. It is particularly strong and stiff. Peculiar. That is the very word. It is not English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. Woven into the paper. E-P-G-T. What do you make of that? The name of the maker, no doubt. Or his monogram, rather. Not at all. The G, with the small t, stands for Gesellstaff, which is the German for company. It is a customary contraction, like RCO. P, of course, stands for Papier. Now, for the E-G, let us glance at our Continental Gazetteer. Eglo, Eglonitz, here we are, Egria. It is a German-speaking country in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad. Remarkable as being the scene of the death of Wallenstein and for its numerous glass factories and paper mills. Ha-ha, <laughs> my boy, what do you make of that? The paper was made in Bohemia. The p precisely, and the man who wrote the note is a German. Do you note the peculiar construction of the sentence? This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or Russian could have not have written that. It is the German who is so uncourteous to his verbs. It only remains, therefore, to discover what is wanted by this German who writes upon Bohemian paper and prefers wearing a mask to show him his face. And here he comes, if I am not mistaken, to resolve all of our doubts. Yes, I hear his carriage now. A pair by the sound of the horses? Yes, a nice little brougham and a pair of beauties. A hundred and fifty guineas apiece. There's money in this case, Watson, if there is nothing else. I think that I had better go, Holmes. Not a bit, Doctor. Stay where you are. I am lost without my bezoil. And this promises to be interesting. It would be a pity to miss it. But your client... Never mind him. I may want your help, and so may he. Here he comes. Sit down in the armchair, Doctor, and give us your best attention. Come in. Good Lord, Holmes, look at the size of him. His limbs will look normal on Hercules. He had just put on his mask, Watson. See? His, stand, his hand is still at it. Oh, you had my note. I told you that I would call. Pray take a seat. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, who is occasionally good enough to help me in my cases. Whom have I honor to address? Well, you may address me as the Count von Krum, a bohemian nobleman. I understand that this gentleman, your friend, is a man of honor and discretion, whom I may trust with a matter of the most extreme importance. If not, I should prefer to communicate with you alone. 
If you prefer, I'll go. No. It is both or none. You may say before this gentleman anything which you may say to me. <sighs> then I must begin by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years. At the end of that time, the matter will be of no importance. At present, it is too much to say that it is of such weight it may be an influence upon European history. I promise. And I. You will excuse this mask. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you. And I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I was aware of it. The circumstances are of great delicacy, and every precaution has to be taken to quench what might grow to be an immense scandal and seriously compromise one of the reigning families of Europe. To speak plainly, the matter implicates the great house of Ornstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. I was also aware of that. <coughs> if your majesty would condescend to state your case, I should be better able to advise you. Uh, <coughs> you are right. I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed? Your Majesty had not spoken before I was aware that I was addressing Wilhelm Gastreich Sigismund von Ormstein, Grand Duke of Castle Falstein, and hereditary king of Bohemia. But you can understand... You can understand that I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person. Yet the matter was so delicate that I could not confide it to an agent without putting myself in his power. I have gone cognito from Prague for the purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult. The facts are briefly these. Some five years ago, during a length visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of a well-known inventorist, Irene Alder. The name is no doubt familiar to you. Let me see. Adler. Here's her file. Huh. Born in New Jersey in the year 1858. Contralto, huh. La Scala, huh. Prima Donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw, yes. Retired from operatic stage, huh. Living in London, quite so. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so, but how? Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal paper or certificates? None. Then I fail to follow your majesty. If this young person should produce her letters for blackmailing or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the writing. Who? Who? Forgery. My private note paper. Stone. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Thought. We were both in the photograph. Oh dear, that is very bad. Yeah. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. I was mad and ins insane. You have compromised yourself seriously. <laughs> I was only crown prince then. I was young. I am but thirty now. It must be recovered. We have tried and failed. Your Majesty must pay. It must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen, then. Five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay ransacked her house. Once we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice she has been waylaid. There has been no result. No sign of it? Absolutely none. <laughs> It is quite a pretty little problem. But it is a very serious one to me. Very indeed. And what does she propose to do with this photograph? To ruin me! But how? I am about to be married. So I have heard. <sighs> to Klotrai Lothman von Sigmaringen, second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. You may know the strict principles of her family. She is herself the very soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. 
and Irene Adler threatens to send them the photograph and she will do it I know that she will do it you do not know her but she has a soul of steel she has the face of the most beautiful of women and the mind of the master of the men rather than I should marry another woman there are no lengths to which she would not go none you are sure that she has not sent it yet? I am sure. And why? Because she has said that she would send it on the day when the betrothal pardon me, was publicly proclaimed. That will be next Monday. Oh, then we have three days yet. That is very fortunate, as I have one or two matters of importance to look into just at present. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Certainly. You will find me at the Longham under the name of the Court Van Krom. Then I shall drop you a line to let you know how we progress. Pray do so. I shall be all anxiety. Then, as to the money... You have got the balance, right? Absolutely. I tell you that I would give one of the provinces of my kingdom to have the photograph. And for present expenses? Uh, there are 300 pounds in gold and 700 in notes. And Mademoiselle's address? It's Brawny Lounge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. One other question. Was the photograph a cabinet? It was. Then, good night, Your Majesty. I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. And good night, Watson. If you will be good enough to call tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, I should like to chat this little matter over with you.